All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Why don't we start with who you are and what you're currently doing in your current business world? Thanks so much for having me here today. Yes, I'm Dr. Jacqueline Kerr. I'm a behavior change scientist. I'm a mum, and I am a burnout survivor. And I host the podcast Overcoming Working Mom Burnout. And um, I'm really trying to also develop leadership programs for women, really coming from the perspective of empowering women to change the world, because I'm pretty fed up with the status quo, (laughs) but also really to draw on the lessons that I have learned from being a behavior scientist and a public health scientist, where we approach the world really focusing on the things that make change happen, but also make it happen in an equitable way. That's such a basis of what we do. So that's what I hope to do as well. Well, and you're doing it. I'm following you on pretty much every social media challenge and watched your TED Talk, which we'll get into later. But um, you're truly one of those people that I wanted to have on the podcast for the season, Women Game Changers, because when you don't believe in something or you think something should be changed, I feel like it is our responsibility to be a part of that change. So thank you so much for doing that. I'm interested though, a lot of change happens with the why, right? why you're doing something, why you want something to change. And often it comes from our shared experiences of something that happened to us. Can you talk a little bit about your crash and burn story or your burnout and what led you to this mission that you have in your life? Yes. Um, so I was a professor, um, a full-time professor at a, um, u- at a university where I was in fact in a school of medicine and um, as anybody who who perhaps knows about how, what a struggle that environment can be, unfortunately it's often quite a toxic environment, but I was building my own research group to help um, communities, workplaces, schools, um, care settings to become healthier and very successfully bringing in millions of dollars from the National Institutes of Health and um, actually becoming one of the top 1% of most cited scientists worldwide. So I was really much following that formula of work really, really hard and nothing's going to stop you, right? Yeah. Um, But I just kept taking on more leadership positions. And as I took on more leadership positions across the university, instead of you know, I was still running my own research group, but then I was part of a a different system where I wasn't necessarily the one um, in charge and that I didn't necessarily share the same values. Mm -hmm. Um, One example was um, I would get phone calls on a a Sunday morning from um, the leader of this particular group where I was also a leader um, telling me that my highly funded research portfolio was not enough. Uh And so it wasn't just that I believed I wasn't enough because I kept going for these more opportunities but that was actually a lot of the messaging that was coming back to me as well and so as that intersected with me being a mom um having my son um diagnosed on the autism spectrum I got to the point where I was crying on the way to work and crying on the way home um because I was burnt out in both places Mm -hmm. and um essentially I did actually experience um a, a period of suicide ideation and I talk about that in my TEDx talk and I had to get help and I had to take a leave of absence and then when I went back having managed to reset my whole sort of physiological fight fright system the stress really hit me so hard on my return and I realized that this type of job was not going to be sustainable for for my health my physical or or mental health or for our family Mm. um so that was when I, I I I left, and and that's one of the unfortunate things when you do leave um, a position like that. I I continued to bring in an income as a consultant, but I was very much then on my own, and so I had no one else to blame yeah. <laughs> anymore. For I couldn't <laughs> ruminate and be resentful of colleagues. So my inner critic came out, and also I lost my identity as a professor, which yes. again I was so proud of, and 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 not proud to say I was proud of that because that was my ego talking. Mm-hmm. But I really had to face my identity crisis, 
my inner critic, who is a um, witch from Shakespeare's Macbeth, <laughs> Scottish witch. Oh, my goodness. So it's been a long journey. Let's just say that. And I think that's really, really important for your listeners to hear. Burnout recovery takes time. And to be honest, because of the personality tendencies I have, I'm always going to be having to manage yes my tendency to to overdo it go into burnout um and again you know when you're passionate about something it happens often people think about burnout as being when you're not engaged but you can be so engaged and yeah. still burn out and actually one of the symptoms this tired but wired really resonates with people who are very passionate about what they do but just cannot switch it off so yes I love that. your story is resonating with me I feel like a bobblehead everything that you're saying <laughs> you know and then the, the dark part part is really studio, suicidal ideation and how that comes out and for women who are so strong and women who want to change the world and want to make an impact and have been moving up the ladder and have been kind of sold this you should be this next that's the crash and burn it's like you're falling further from the top of the ladder and the fall is super brutal Tell me what your life has been like after this, right? So from one burnout survivor to another, I feel like we're in a support group here. Um, you know, it's a burnout recovery is not a circle. In my opinion, it's a spiral. And it's something that you will always have a wound with and you can be prevalent to burn out again and again because you've done it, right? I know I've plotted out, I've burned out five times, right? And I'm only 42. So tell me about your journey after burnout or at least this burnout what, what right. has been your journey right now um and you said it take a it takes a while which we know that it does but what is what is kind of the what are those tips that are keeping you out of the deep end right keeping you swimming versus drowning right and, and just to mention too with the um suicide ideation again that the, the shame that you can feel in that as a mother yeah. but also the message to your listeners is you know, don't let it get that far. Burnout has 12 stages and, and that's towards the end of those 12 stages. Um, at stage one is the need to prove yourself. Yeah. So let's look at it right there. We yeah. prove ourselves, we work harder, we suppress our needs, we start to disconnect, we then maybe change our behaviors, have some unhealthy coping. There's so many stages earlier that we could point to and prevent so let's really sort of think about it from that framework and the other point on the suicide ideation that I also learned in my recovery journey was learning about the language of emotions you know having grown up in an English boarding school emotions were not something that were right. were, were allowed Pipe <laughs> really. down or you're going to get the ruler right <laughs> right yes absolutely so so I did not know how to express my emotions and when I started to to learn about how to do that and I learned that actually suicide ideation is that you are looking for a new life. You want the life you have to end, not your life to end. Yes. And that was absolutely true. I needed to find a different life. And I was, my body was telling me I was absolutely looking for a new life. So, I mean, that really helped me understanding my emotions, starting to be able to express them. I, I did a lot of reading. One of the books I read on parenting actually also said the same. If you don't let your kids express their emotions, they'll never know what they need and be able to ask for what they want. Yeah. And I was like, oh, it explains oh, so much why yeah. I'm here now in this situation of, of more freedom, you know, running my own business, having more freedom, but not really knowing what I want. Yeah. Um, so that's been a huge part about it because also then expressing those feelings and needs as a parent and a mom to my husband, for example, struggling with um, my son's mental health and supporting him, but coming away from those interactions feeling drained and actually admitting to my husband I found that hard mm -hmm. so now he still says yep you're the right one to go in and do that <laughs> but thanks for doing it because I appreciate how much it drains mm -hmm. you right yes. that's a totally different conversation to me having resentment that I'm the one solving everyone's yeah. problems or yeah. that you know it, yeah. it changes things so that to me was a, a huge root of it and recognizing now where stress lies in in my body mm. um because again this is the thing where we're often the the frog in the in the pot and the water is just getting hotter and hotter and we have no idea that we're, we're experiencing stress and particularly if you're like me and and have a whole life of stress management through exercise yeah. 
then you you don't necessarily always experience it um, in the same way. Um, so one of the things I try to really think about is where do I feel it in my body? And when do I know that I am tipping into um, feeling higher stress? And for me, it's not necessarily during the day when I could be doing stressful things. Mm -hmm. It's actually when I get in the car and drive to pick up the kids from school. Mm -hmm. And it's not that the journey is stressful, but I feel it in my chest, very yes. heavy, like an elephant's foot on my chest. And I know, okay, what is happening? What, what, what am I feeling? Something is, is going on here. And I think also when I tip into those things of like feeling like I really have to do certain things and have to be on my computer when, you know, actually that's, that's breakfast and I want to sit and have breakfast with the kids. Yes. So when I start to really see those intersections of the times that I've really tried to set aside of being present and available to kids mm -hmm. and then starting to be distracted during those times, um, those are other signals for me, but it took a lot of coaching, uh, a lot of reading. And um, I think some of the, the same lessons also apply, because if we think about companies and, and burnout in companies, we're thinking about what are the, the values that those companies have and do they align with you? Um, and, and how do you want to, um, you know, how can you for example, do job crafting within a company so that you can have the focus and purpose that you want. And those translate also to you as a, a mumpreneur or running a business where you also need to make the choices of the clients um, based on your, your values and yes. crafting the life you want to see. Yes. Um, it, it sounds very hard to do that when you're really chasing a, an income, um, but really it's about choices. That's actually the biggest thing also I had to learn was I was not a victim of my choices. Right. I, I felt like it, but yep. I was making choices and choices have costs. Absolutely. You know, when you tend to just grab every opportunity and see it as a positive, great mm -hmm. thing, um, it's really sitting down and taking time to recognize you're making a decision and have you thought about the cost? Because how often do we just say yes when we don't realize we're saying yes, yes. we weren't even asked to volunteer. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> so you want to have your hand raised because that's the kind of girl you are. Absolutely. Exactly. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. So you've yep. really got to look at all the, the costs of every opportunity mm -hmm. so that you can make those decisions much more um, consciously and, and with a framework to inform how you're making those decisions. Absolutely. A lot to unpack there. I love what you said, Jacqueline, about when you are in the process of saying to yourself internally, I can't live on this planet anymore. I don't want to live this life anymore. I don't want to live. I love what you said about you're saying you don't want that life anymore. It's not that you don't want to live. And that's a huge distinction. When you said that, something literally pierced my gut to say, that is brilliant. And I think if we start having those conversations around what is it in your life that is when you're verbalizing that, that is the moment. Hopefully we're working upstream, right? The moment you start to feel a little bit of burnout in stage run. But often yeah, that's resentment, not the case, Resentment's right? the first cue. But often that's not the case. And let's just mm -hmm. put it out there. Real, reality is you don't really seek help until you're at your dark moment sometimes. And so how can we stop people getting to that point? And the moment that you in your own mind are starting to have those narratives about is this life worth living? I feel like I'm wasting my life. Anything surrounding that, that is your moment to stop and pause and ask for help and say, it's not necessarily that I want to harm myself. It's that I can't live this life any longer. And that is a huge distinction. When that, when you were going through that, were you saying this internally in your mind or were you reaching out to your husband or your closest girlfriend? What what were you doing in your internal world versus external world? Because I think that's something that a lot of people don't talk about. A lot of people are suffering in silence with burnout because we're looking around Jacqueline and we're saying, everybody's burned out. Who am I to raise the white flag? Because everybody is, right? So what conversations did you personally have with yourself in your internal world and then in your external world? And how did you finally bridge that gap? Because it feels like a wide gap sometimes. Right. And and it's a, a very insightful question there. So actually what happened to me, and again, I, I described this a little bit on in my TEDx talk, is um, 
I got to a point one evening where I really felt like I couldn't go on. It was the 3rd of January. It was the start of a new year. I just could not face another year like this. I, I wasn't sleeping. My back teeth were cracked. My cortisol levels were high. As I say, crying on the way to work, crying on the way home, um, fighting with my husband, you know, losing my temper with my kids. I, I was not the person I wanted to be. And this certainly was not the 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 life that that I, that I wanted i mean what i was role modeling to my daughter was just not what i wanted for her but um so i you know in that dark place i basically started to write a letter to my kids yeah. saying sorry that that i'm i'm not enough right sorry um please try and do these things in your life you know please go outside um be in nature um you know believe in yourself all these things that really was advice to myself mm. and i think the last line that was the line that hit me and and um helped me was i said sorry i couldn't ask for help mm. yes and i was just like why am I saying that? Why can't I ask for help? Mm. And I get it. It's really, really hard to ask for help. And it was, you know, for me as super mom needs nothing, does everything to actually admit, you know, at, at this point I realized I needed help. I mean, you yeah. know, I was You're writing, writing it down. Letter. You're telling your kids to do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that was such um, an eye opener for me. And, and so that's really how I first approached it. I then said to my husband, look, you know, I wrote a letter to the kids last night, you know, mm. this is how I'm feeling. Um, and he straight away said, okay, you know, can you, can we get you into therapy? Can you take a break from work? We, we need to do this. Um, we, you know, we need to, we need to help you here. And, and again, that internal, um, I'm not a person who asks for help. Asking for help is weak. Um, you know, crying is weak. But kind of once I started to actually admit that, it was like my whole body took over anyway. Oh. It started sending me into panic attacks, all sorts of other things where I couldn't control yeah. my tears anymore. Good. So um Good. Your so body's many, saying, I am yeah. taking over now. You're not listening. Yeah. Exactly. And so many people describe yeah. that where actually, um, you know, burnout, when you notice it is, is is because your your body has interrupted, as I say, panic attacks and illness, inability to get out of bed at all, complete brain fog where you're not working. Yeah. So often it's the physical manifestations where our body literally, like you say, is you're not listening, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I'm going to stop you. And, yeah. and so that actually w was the same that, that, that happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, um, though, the, you know, that's the. Yeah. That's so incredibly beautiful. It's so incredibly heartbreaking, but I'm um, good for you having the strength internally to write a letter to your kids. And for, it was your inner voice coming out. You know, you cannot lie on a piece of paper. I tell you, and you can't, you can't lie to your body, your body, Finally, I call, it, I call it hijacks your soul and takes the wheel, right? To say, you are worth this. You are so much wor more worthy than you ever had thought before. I'm curious, you know, we'll go into your TED Talk here in a minute. And I know you have a lot of science behind the work that you do. But I just want to tap into someone who, like you, has been through kind of the wave as I have. What would you say is your, was a pivotal moment for you where you look back and you say, if that wouldn't have happened, then I wouldn't have been in such a sense of unworthiness and feeling like I was discarded or feeling like I, my life didn't make a difference or feeling like the impact I was making wasn't um, impactful in the world. A lot of times in women in their careers, when you your identity is wrapped up in your job or your role, walking away or choosing to walk away to save yourself and leave your job, you have to do an unraveling of patterns of behavior. Who are you after you don't have a job anymore? Who are you when you're not that scientist anymore? Who are you? Who is Jacqueline? What was the, the self-discovery or what was kind of the unraveling of the old Jacqueline into the new Jacqueline? What did that look like for you? You mentioned going to therapy, but what was the biggest catalyst for you to unravel the, those behaviors and step into a new life? Mm-hmm. 
And as I say, I think that a couple of things we've talked about in terms of tools that help you do that. One, one is the writing. And actually, you know, I did a, an exercise, the Tara Moore's exercise, exercise about finding your inner mentor. Yeah. And my inner mentor was a writer, was an old lady in an English cottage with books <laughs> on the bookshelf and a writer. And she just told me, whatever you do, write, and that will help you solve your problems. Wow. Um, and I think another tool that I used in this moment, um, again, back to what we kind of said, but one that I really want to leave your listeners with is, is choice. Um, so as a British person here in the US, I kept sort of saying it's something about me here being in the US that is the problem. And I didn't want to leave and the family and leave my children. That wasn't my values. So I had to balance those values against this feeling of not belonging. Oh. And so my um, coach actually said to me, okay, every day, just say, today I choose to stay. Oh. And that gave me so much power because she said, the day you can't say that is the day you know you're ready to go. But if you can still say that, then, um, you know, then you don't have to worry about it. Like my mind was struggling with this decision. Yes. And instead she was saying, don't try and make any decisions. Just say today I choose to stay. And oh, then, beautiful. you know, because it and it took away so much of my mental energy worrying about something that probably really wasn't the, the problem. Mm -hmm. So so to go to answer your, your question a little more directly now, um, if we think about that wheel, like needing to prove yourself. So where did that come from, right? Really is is the key mm -hmm. to this. Um, and essentially it was, it, it was from, from my childhood, mm -hmm. um, basically being told I, I wasn't the smart one and um, feeling like whatever I did, it didn't count because it came from hard work. Yeah. And so I kept getting this messaging back. Oh, you know, yes, your, your brother does well because he's smart. Mm. You only do well because because you work hard. So it, it's that sort of um, it, catch 22. Nothing I could do would be good enough because it had always come from hard work. Yes. Um, and so and then then I think also the messaging we, we do get around um, having to work hard and how important hard work is, mm -hmm. you know, that really um, continued to, to, to drive me. And it, and it made me very successful. Yes. But when I then um, actually read uh, Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, and started to understand, no, nobody gets anywhere in the world without talent and hard work. Right? Right. And so I had these yeah. external facts of mm -hmm. where I was in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, you know, I, I had a PhD. I'm in this yeah. top scientist list, right? Uh, um, clearly, I, I got there because I have a mix yeah. of talent and, and hard work. And so that also just helped me understand fixed mindsets that yes. weren't helpful. Um, so, so that's really been part of it. But to be honest, I think I'm going to always have this Grand Canyon of, of self-belief. And the question is, how often will I fall into it? Yes. How deep will it be? How long will it take me to recognize it? And how quickly will I get out of it? So th these are things that um, a lot of developing a lot more emotional intelligence um, really has helped me think through and, and address these things. And again, you know, I think what's great about thought models, for example, that um, coaches provide you where, you know, you look at a fact and you, you look at the situation and then you say, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What are the actions and what are the results? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can't change your thoughts or feelings, right. but you can act anyway and actually I found that a fantastic tool another great tool that I use and it was only recently when I was trying to help my son using the same tool to help him with his mindset because his mindset set is you know as a as an adolescent it's fine his mindset is is everything sucks I hate it I hate myself for hating it and then you're in this cycle and my cycle is I'm not enough I'll try harder I'll keep trying harder I'm exhausted I'm not enough and mm -hmm. that's my cycle and when yes. I was explaining to him and realized almost any situation he could give me he responded in the same way almost any situation I respond in the way same way and so my way out of that is what do I need need yes. it's to accept it's acceptance is my answer I have to accept yeah this was I, I maybe haven't you know done as much as I wanted but I do not want to exhaust myself yes. um, and so rather than piling judgment on top of my 
whatever perceived lack of achievement. It, it's just to say, I accept it for what it is and it's okay. And some, you know, and that's my message. And for my son, we, we worked on one, whereas, yeah, this sucks, but maybe I can learn from it too. Mm -hmm. And so we both found our way to create those messages that really seem to apply so often no matter the situation. Yeah. And I think so many people, I mean, we're so hard on ourselves and I think mm. the societal expectations that are put in place for women and just in people in general is, you know, it's that circular wheel. You meet a goal and then the goal line moves and you meet that goal and it's constantly, you're running a race that you're never going to win. And what if we thought about maybe the winning is accepting that the race you just won is enough, right? And there'll be a different race. And it's really acknowledging that it's the fact that you started and you finished the race, whatever that length of race or achievement of race is. Thank you for that. I love what you're saying about you're teaching your son these skills, because I think in the next generation, it, it, the next generation scares me, right? Certainly politically and the world that we're living in, but it's such great um, positivity to think that parents in the world like you are really teaching your kid or kids what you went through and what to do and what not to do. You're leaving a legacy for them to hopefully breathe a little bit easier and make that burnout cycle a little bit shorter, right? For those people who haven't seen your TED Talk, I love it. I love the analogy of the baked Alaska because I'm from Alaska, but tell me a little bit about um, what the key takeaway from your TED Talk is. And we're going to obviously drop uh, the link in the chat later, but tell me like your the spark that came about for you to like magnify your voice, right? And want this out in the world and how you came up with the idea and tell me about the experience. Thank you so much for this opportunity. So one of the reasons when I was in... Um, Academia, again, one part of burnout um, is, uh, as well as the exhaustion, the inefficiencies that you're doing, you're working harder, but not getting as much out of it, is um, another symptom is cynicism. And I remember sitting in a room just going, we are having no impact with this research. So one of my justifications to myself for re leaving was saying, you know, in the academic world, I have impact on other scientists and I have impact on the communities that I help. But I I was not satisfied, of course, with that. So that was one of my reasons for thinking outside of academia, maybe I can have more impact. So that was something that was kind of um, driving me. But then as I then tried to step into the world, so I only joined social media in 2021. <laughs> It's not something you need in my line of research. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And of course, then I was just like, oh my goodness, what is this, mm -hmm. this thing? And I felt so terrified um, in it. And so for my mind, I was like, okay, I really do want to get my message out there um, of, of what burnout is yeah. how it affects moms, um, how it's not a personal problem. This is not an individual issue. This is a societal issue. Um, this is caused by, by so many things, societal expectations and our workplace environments and our own personalities and dynamics and things. But um, for me, I, I thought about the TEDx stage being a safer place than Facebook. So, you know, I had obviously been a public speaker uh, as a professor and and really since I was about 10 years old um so I love the idea of being able to tell my story mm -hmm. and my science yeah. in in one place um so it resonated with me and again I made it then a goal and and took all the steps I needed to 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 get there I, you know I had a help from companies that help you you know put applications and prepare your talk and be ready to step onto that stage because it's still despite a lot of experience that I have with talking, it was, it was extremely terrifying. <laughs> and again, because I was talking about such an emotional mm -hmm. topic. Yeah. So I think the message that I want people to take away from that is that burnout is not an individual issue. It's yeah. influenced by all these things. And I use that analogy of the baked Alaska. One is, you know, as, as mums, we often feel like baked Alaska being 
blowtorch to perfection from the outside, but trying to protect, you know, this this life and this family um, on the inside, the, the cold ice cream, but also the different layers, the cake, the ice cream, the meringue, um, those represent the layers of our individual lives, our, our personalities, our interpersonal relationships, our institutions that we work in mm -hmm. and society at large. And all those things influence us. And some people don't want to hear that because they think that they're a, a victim of the system. But actually, I, I see it differently. One, let's be realistic about what we're up against. Mm -hmm. And that is more empowering than trying to deny that we're part of a system. Um, two, when you realize you're part of a system and it influences you, you also can influence it back because as an individual, when you role model things out loud, or like you say, you you teach your kids, your family changes, you take yourself to work and you, you, you demonstrate different behaviors, you demonstrate healthy work habits, that affects your colleagues, that starts to affect, you know, the whole workplace, and then again, out in society. So I see that we can, um, the, the system influences us, but we absolutely can influence it back and have that ripple effect. And then for me, also, the third piece is, you know, we can have a lot more self-compassion. The, the, you know, the system, the, the influences of these multi-level influences, they're not excuses. They're actually reasons why behavior change is so hard. So I can have a lot more self-compassion when I realize what I'm up against. When I started to understand things like the maternal wall and the motherhood penalty, I was like, no wonder what I've been yes. doing has been so hard. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot more self-compassion, but I also have more compassion for the next person who is also struggling in their life. And I don't just sort of blame them um, for not being able to do the things and meet the goals that they wanted. I actually understand, no, we're, we're actually up against against um, a lot of um, social expectations around motherhood, social expectations about being the ideal worker, 24 seven available as a mom, 24 seven available as a worker. And, you know, this, this is just um, not reasonable and um, not healthy and, and, and doesn't lead to more productivity, innovation or profitability either. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, that's really the the message I want folks to take away is um, that this is this is not an individual problem, and self care is not the answer, mm -hmm. right? Because right. I described six different burnout profiles, and they um, are, are yes. One of them is overwork, the high achiever, but there's also um, the the perfectionist people pleaser who who is exhausted helping other people and not getting yes. anything back in return. Um, there's the busy lost souls who who are just don't ever get time to focus and they're constantly being distracted and have no purpose. There's the devalued worker who's putting in so much time and effort is not getting promotions, is not getting fair pay. The marginalized worker who is um, being um, dismissed and and on the receipt of microaggressions and bias in the workplace. Um, and then the last group is those that really have gone into that fight flight state where, you know, they, they need uh, medical help at that stage. So it it's, you know, the burnout is not the solution is not a vacation if you're a marginalized worker who's experiencing burnout because of the racial traumas you experience at work um so th that's what's um so important to understand and unfortunately you know most of our leaders are white male ceos who may have experienced burnout and are i mean the data deloitte recently showed CEOs are burning out, but their employees do not think that they are communicating in the, the about wellness and burnout in a way that resonates with them. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I think it goes back to the CEO is a human too. And so they are not right. immune to the multiple cycles of burnout. They're not immune to being a people pleaser. They're not immune to being an overachiever. And I guess I would argue that that's where we should start. I mean, often we need to start at a systemic level, but it also, you know, I like to talk about change from the bottom up, like we've talked about, but really um, leaders and managers, we have an opportunity and coming from my leadership background to know our employees, know what spectrum they're on and the rain, the burnout rainbow of cynicism versus crash and burn and being able to almost identify like Jacqueline's at this stage, Hannah's at this stage, what do I need to do as a leader and manager to help them, right? Get the help that they need. And I think as people return to work, 
or we redesign the new healthcare system or, or workplace systems, we really need to teach employees and managers and those middle line managers, especially what to look for, not just signs and symptoms of burnout, but actually at what cycle and where there's different interventions at different points of different cycles. And I, so I think that, um, you know, I know I'm doing that work and my consulting, I want to hear from you specifically when you're in the field and providing a talk on burnout or giving a speaking engagement on burnout, um, what are you hearing from organizations right at this moment, right? So we went through COVID, we're still in COVID, depending on who you ask, but we're still in the middle of COVID and we're also in the great resignation, but now we're at the kind of coming down at the tail end, right? Where are people working? If they are working, are they working at a high functioning level? Are they quiet quitting? Whatever they're doing, what are you hearing from organizations systemically like a common theme that they're saying, we need help with X, Y, Z, Jacqueline. What are you hearing? So I think, uh, you know, one of the, the biggest issues is that we are um, providing Band-Aids and potentially bad advice. And, and I think um, that's where people are at. They're starting to realize that they're playing whack-a-mole with all these problems that are coming at them. And, and they're frustrated at their lack of impact. They're frustrated mm. by the, the employee surveys that are saying they are not helping, right? Mm. You know, employees are, are, are dissatisfied, yet companies are trying all sorts of things. They're throwing, uh, and, and one, one example that was, was recently came out in a report um, was, you know, it's like throwing spaghetti against the wall right yeah. so that is an extremely frustrating um place to be um and as we head into um a potential recession it's not a good place to be from a business perspective of you are are more than ever going to be um held accountable to be having impact mm -hmm. in a time when um employees are going to become even more stressed than ever because of the 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 financial stresses of a recession on top of the the lingering COVID stresses, um, you know, mental health stresses, um, racial reckoning. We, we have never been before been in a time like this with so much challenging complexity. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really what I'm trying to help organizations with is, is how do you lead in a complex world um, and, and, uh, having not faced this type of um, problem before, uh, and we don't have evidence-based solutions mm -hmm. to these problems because we haven't had them before, but what we do have, and from, from my um, field, is evidence-based processes for how you problem solve and create change in complex situations. And that's what we do every day as public health practitioners. Um, so I'm trying to use those lessons of, of understanding. Yes, understanding it's complicated, but yes, use these tools to go, okay, it's complicated at these different levels. I now have more compassion for you know, the situation that we're, we're in here. I understand it at multiple levels. I understand what to do at those multiple levels. And I also really understand what, um, change is how you make change what are the conditions you need to create to have change because if there isn't psychological safety in the first place then then don't expect anybody to show up and respond to whatever um change that you are you are trying to create Absolutely. um so all these things are are so important as well as in this whole process managing your own burnout mm -hmm. um so that's really um how I'm trying to help in particular um, women leaders is to be able to lead with credibility and confidence and calm through these really turbulent waters where you can't actually predict what the next problem is, but at least if you have a framework for how to solve problems um, in, in a, a much more um, comprehensive way than, um, and, 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 and in through that, you're, you're not only going to be able to ha have more compassion and be able to touch people more clearly by your greater understanding of, of, you know, life's whole problems, mm -hmm. you know, the whole person, the, their community, et cetera. Um, but you can actually also then come up with um, much better solutions and, and create better connections in that process too. Absolutely. I love the way you describe that. I have, you know, as a new CEO and founder of a burnout company, it's been shocking to me 
that we seem to be reinventing wheels over and over and over again when it's systemically chosen and proven that science and the way to go of like the change management cycle and how to create a foundation for psychological safety. And as a manager and leader for 20 years in the healthcare industry, it was shocking to me that there wasn't investment happening at the higher level in those managers to teach those managers, those leaders, those employees, how to create a psychological safety um, in the organization. Not just that, but like what constitutes change management? And when companies are surveying employees, what do you do with that information after you receive it? And communicating, just simply communicating, Jacqueline, we just did a survey and here's what we're going to do with it. Not just fill this out because how many times as employees have we heard them say, it doesn't matter what I write, nothing is going to change. And so I love what you said about this being a pivotal moment in our lives across organizational landscapes to say, let's stop. Let's pause. Let's reassess. Where are we right now? Change readiness survey, change readiness, you know, uh, examination, whatever you want to do, and really work um, at the, I guess, striation level, at the different layers of epidermis of an organization to figure out where does the growth need to happen and where does the training need to happen. If if an organization is listening to us right now and it's a CEO that's like, I've tried everything. We've brought in DEI. We've you know had hired consultants like Hannah and Jacqueline. We don't seem to be getting anywhere. What do you say to them? What do you what do you what is the next step for them to hear right at this moment on how we people like us can help them at this change in the game? Right, and, and I think uh, it's so important, really, to then unpack those those root causes. Not only just the root causes of the problem, but the the root causes why the solutions are are, are not working. And that's a very uncomfortable process. I I understand that. And again, HR leaders are not the ones who are going to want to put their hand up and say we are failing. We need to look at what's happening here. Um, and I I understand that that fear and that yeah. fear fear of, of, and it's real. of failure it's oh real. yes it's, it's totally real yes yeah absolutely um but i but i think that's the thing is when you come to that tipping point of of wasting more time effort and money in ineffective solutions you know there comes that tipping point where, where you where you just um you know have to end up then then facing those those fears um and essentially that's part of it right how do we how do we um help people feel comfortable um in, in that process um i think that's that's so important um but also then as i say then then you're really looking to say you know what are the conditions here so so creating psychological safety to to unpack this this problem these problems these lack of solutions that we're in um that is always the the first step for um a, a management and leadership team to have psychological safety mm -hmm. to basically um you know look at these these problems or these let's say failures mm -hmm. or, or uh, mistakes and and be able to learn from them and that is also exactly what emotional intelligence is so those are those are the starting points because again i think there's um you know it is is definitely lack of understanding of of what um psychological safety is yes. I, I mean i listened to a um a podcast with an hr leader from a huge organization who basically was saying psychological safety is when we're transparent about whether somebody's going to be fired or not <laughs> and i was like Okay, there there is yeah. definitely and and again the burnout is only overwork, right? The, there's definitely yeah. some education um, that that needs to come in here. But as behavior scientists, you know, education is just like the first leg of a table, right. um, and and so much more needs to to happen. Um, so that's really when you can have this process of of supporting people okay. through change Absolutely. and understanding that um, again because because we're for example investing money in on unconscious bias training and not only is it not working but it can be having negative effects yes. because we're assuming that um, we're now 
aware of our biases and so we don't have to do anything else about it whereas actually no we need to have bias interruption techniques that take um practice that take feedback that take safety to be able to implement those um so again it it is understanding sort of the this the immensity of the challenge and again not seeing that as then oh no we can't do it it's 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 oh great now we can break it down and and target the the different levels and the different components we need because it does seem like it's an an enormous hill to climb i mean i guess you and i can have another support group after this about you know it seems like there's so much work to do right just go on linkedin and if you weren't burned out before you're burned out now because so many people are saying that they're burned out and it's like it's become a norm and that's what's so scary jacqueline is like being burned out now is a norm which scares me tremendously how do you keep your hope alive in doing this work? Because it does seem such like such a big hill to climb. You've got the research behind it. You know what works. You've been through it. So you know that it's a long and arduous process. What is that North Star that's guiding you? Because this is a really, uh, honestly, a big question that I ask myself on a daily basis because it seems like a big hill to climb because there's so many people to help. You're one person. What is that North Star that keeps you going? Right. And again, that's where when something becomes a norm or or really what we can describe as an epidemic, right, that's when public health comes in. Because in public health, you're not I'm not you're not ever trying to just go one to one with people. So again, coaching, I really value very respected people need it. But that's one to one. What we need is one to many. Mm. And and so for me, that is it, it has always been how do I create the the systems change so that these things become easier? Yes. You know, it, it, it's as easy as um, for example, making something a default in a situation. So uh, an example I use is if you think about the key cards that are in hotel rooms, um, when um instead of having to turn out the light, you take the key card out and and the lights turn off. Well, that's a fantastic um, energy saving tool that was extremely easy for you as the individual to do. You didn't even have to think about it anymore. And so that's again, how can we design um, systems and workplaces through through defaults like that? So that actually, I mean, that is totally to make the change the the easiest thing to do is absolutely the the way that we do it from behavior change science um at scale from public health so both of those give me um so much uh hope and and confidence that these type of problems are are solvable we we solve epidemic overwhelming complicated problems all the time and you're just the woman to do it. So thank you so much. I want to end here because we've talked about your personal burnout story. We've talked about the fact that you are a woman game changer in science. You're a burnout survivor. You've been through it. You're giving us your incredible advice. I don't want to frame it as what do you hope to accomplish left in your life because you've done so much and let's face it, you're already there, right? And looking back on the mountain, you've already done so much. From one burnout survivor to another, I hope that means something to you, but what's left? What is that one thing that you're like, I am so excited about this that's actually happening in my life that probably wouldn't have happened, Jacqueline, if you didn't go through what you went through. What is that? If you can think about that. Yeah. And and it's so funny because in those first days when I first bought a journal to write in, I remember writing and just going, how can I help? other women and so essentially um and I looked at that and laughed at myself because I was I was just like I'm a bloody mess how could I ever help another woman like you this just was so um you know um ridiculous in my mind but that's that's still what what drives me so for me I I absolutely want to help um other women to be able to lead through this complexity and have the the confidence and credibility to do that. Um, And so again, even though, uh, you know, I I talk about systems change, when you also um, support the leaders and and help leaders have different frameworks that that also um, think through the systems, then they are going to become um, stronger leaders. And and that's really what I want. I want to 
empower women leaders to change the world. Mm, That's beautiful. Thank you so much for inspiring me and for our listeners today. Uh, For more information on Jacqueline, we'll drop her information on the chat, but I just wanted to thank you for taking the time today and share your incredible story and wisdom with us. You are making a difference in the world and you've made a difference in mine. So thank you. Thanks so much.